open up your Bibles. We're going to jump right into this word. Uh, real quickly, just in case I forget, tonight we do this once a month. I have a tremendous ministerial staff here that assists me with the word. They minister usually on the third Sunday nights. We call that an hour of power. We're going to have a preach-a-thon tonight that I want you to come. Some of the most powerful preachers in our church will be ministering tonight um, in one hour. Somebody say one hour. I'm going to ask you like Jesus, can you watch with me for one hour? Now, if you go home and drink some tea and fall asleep, you ain't going to make it back. But we want you to come out tonight. These great men and women here are part of our ministerial staff. They have been proven. They've been tested. They've been uh, elevated. And they're going to minister here tonight between 5 and 6. So I want you to come out, support them. Um, I know it will bless you. And um, it's important to me, too, uh, that you hear these other voices. So hopefully you can come back tonight at 5 p.m for our hour of power. Let's jump into this word. We're going to look at John, the 13th chapter, and then go to Luke, the 22nd chapter. Uh, if you have the sermon notes, you will see it, but I still want to encourage you to bring your Bibles to church um, and be able to find the scriptures for yourself, mark it up in your Bible, take notes, uh, and go through the entire experience to those of you that are streaming and to those of you that are in the sanctuary, all of my sermon notes are online. You can access them by going to victoriouspraise.org forward slash sermons. Again, another part of what we're doing here to help you to have a great Christian experience. If you remember when you were in college and uh, you would go to the lecture and if you didn't make it, you would ask somebody to do what? take notes for you. And if they're really studious, they would actually bring a recorder and record the actual lecture. Well, we didn't did all that for you. The notes are online, and usually by Wednesday, even the sermon is online. So you actually have the sermon notes, and you actually have the lecture online. Um, so we want you to really immerse yourself into this experience, and I promise you it will be a blessing to you. John 13 and 21, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Look to your left. Look to your right. I don't know who it is, but I don't know. Got my eye on you, though. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting, or actually, the better translation, wondering who it was. Wondering which one of y'all gonna give me up. Go to verse 25. He then, lying on Jesus' breath, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Some of y'all so nosy. You just want to have a scoop, don't you? You're all up in social media, scrolling through Facebook, trying to figure out who's saying what, when, where, how you want to call. Girl, I heard, yeah, tell me about it. And this is who Peter was. Peter was all over the place. Uh, he just went, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered and said, he, is, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas, the scariest, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, Judas, and said, Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do it quickly. Do it quickly. Finally, Luke 22 and 47, Luke 22 and 47 says, and while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said to Judas, Betrayest thou the Son of Man with a 
kiss. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they sent to him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Should we fight him? One of them that smote the servant, one of them didn't even ask. He just went in. That was probably Peter again. That joker right here. Can you imagine Jesus said, like, Lord, this joker right here. Peter was all over the place. And one of them that smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, suffer ye this. Enough of this mess. And he touched his ear and healed him. So today, uh, in this series, Rising Out of the Ashes, I want to look at how do you rise, rise out of betrayal. How do you rise out of betrayal when you feel like you've been betrayed? How do you rise out of that? How do you rise out of that? We've been looking at all of these different ways to rise out of the ashes. Looked at Job. Looked at uh, David. We've looked at Abraham. Looked at Paul. I want to look at the relationship between Jesus and Judas. Jesus and Judas. Betrayal is defined as to expose to danger by treachery. To deceitfully reveal secrets or information. To turn against or be disloyal. To turn against or be disloyal. And so when we go back to what it means to rise out of ashes, which is to emerge from destruction. Today we're going to learn how to emerge from the destruction of betrayal. To make a comeback from the disaster of betrayal. To come back when you've been betrayed, to come back. The challenge we're going to face with this, and, and oh, by the way, pray for me. I am, uh, even though I'm preaching this series, uh, this is probably going to be my next book. Uh, I hope to, if the Lord say the same, complete that before this year is out. Of the same topic, rising out of the ashes. Um, but when we look at this, one of the things that you will learn or that you know about betrayal is that it has to come from someone that's close to you. Only someone close to you can expose you. Someone close to you can let or reveal your confidence, those things that you've shared with them in secret. Only someone close to you who know your triggers can actually hurt you like that. It's the pain of betrayal. Here's how David described it. He said, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who did eat my bread. Let me be real clear. Some of y'all be working with people for 15 years. They ain't never been to the house, though. Y'all ain't working with me. Y'all been coming to this church for 20 years. Ain't none of y'all. And, and, and a lot of y'all ain't invited pastor to the house yet. He's my pastor, but I don't let anybody up in the house. Y'all remember back in the day when people were breaking your house and steal stuff? What's the first thing you knew? It was one of these ninjas that been in my house. Because they knew exactly where my stuff was. 
Strangers don't bust into your house because they don't know what you got. It was somebody that you let in your house. You thought they was having a good time. They were like, okay, you got a 17, 18, 25 inch TV. I see a stereo over there. <laughs> somebody say close. David described them as familiar friends. It's defined as best friend. One you completely trust. That is the one that turned against me. Now here's what's interesting. It amazes me the number of you all lose your mind over folk that ain't even that close. Like, really? You already knew they didn't like you. I mean, you knew from day one that wasn't a real smile. It was one of them nice, nasty smiles. And then you about to lose it. I just can't believe it. Yes, you can believe it. You knew that in your spirit when you first met them. Something ain't right about them. But I'm reminded by Maya Angelou said, when a person shows you who they are, believe them the first time. You don't got to be shocked because they did what they did. So those people don't betray us. We already knew we had the eye on them anyway. But the pain of betrayal doesn't come from enemies or fake frenemies. It comes from what David called familiar. Familiar friends. These are lovers and family members and spouses and best friends. People who we say, but I know you. I've been knowing you for years. You've eaten my food, rode in my car. We know each other at an intimate level. Oh, by the way, I always tell people that intimacy is just, when you become intimate with somebody, it's not about sex. That's about sharing intimate knowledge. Y'all ain't working with me. And so people who have sex is because they became first intimate. At least most of y'all. Okay, that went over three of y'all head. And so they know the intimate things that you don't reveal to everybody else. Like most of the people on your job don't, know, don't really know about you. They just know you show up to work and get your paycheck. Most people at your church don't really know you. They just know you're the girl that's on the third row, three seats in. And they kind of know you when they see you at Walmart. You, but they don't have an intimate knowledge of you. Can I preach? So betrayal can only come from those who are intimate who have intimate knowledge of us. That's what makes it so painful, which is why even our Lord and Savior took a step back and say, for real, Judas, you're going to betray me with a kiss? Because you don't let everybody kiss you. You know, somebody come in like, hold on, I don't know you like that. <laughs> you shake your hand over here. So clearly they were intimate. They were close. They had walked together for three years. Let's talk about that today. Rising out of the ashes of betrayal, look at your neighbor and say, the pain of familiar friends. The pain of intimate friends. The pain of close friends. So let's talk about this from when they're unknown, when they are revealed, and then how do we respond to them. Rising out of the ashes of betrayal, the pain of familiar friends. Everybody say the unknown. 
Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. This is your first challenge is how do you deal with something that you don't know? How do you uh, uh, see something that you can't see? It's unknown. Betrayal by default, as I've stated, comes from somebody that's close to you. But also by default, we have no idea from who it's going to come from. Because let me be real clear, if I knew you were going to betray me, then you wouldn't betray me because I wouldn't tell you nothing. Can I come to the house? No, I'll just meet you. <laughs> Y'all ain't working with me. You know that first date? We, we, I'll just meet you at the movie. I don't even want you to know where I stay. Can I pick you up? No, I drive myself. I don't know you like that. Just in case you're crazy. I could just ghost and disappear. Preach, Pastor Will. And, and, and so, it's got to be someone that's close, but we don't know who. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't even know where. Now, let me ask you this rhetorical question. How many of you have ever had something happen devastating that you never saw coming? Anybody ever had something like that? I mean, it just crushed you. You didn't see, look at your neighbor and say, didn't see that one coming. Didn't see that one coming. If it truly devastated you, it had to have come from an intimate place. It's not that things haven't happened to you before. Because if you live in this world, stuff will happen. The Bible says it's impossible, but that offenses will occur. But what makes this so devastating, preach Pastor Will, is that I didn't see it coming from you. I didn't see it coming from this place. I didn't think my own family, boy, preach right there. My own children, I didn't think my own lover, my own spouse would do this. And so it makes it extremely devastating. A professional boxer gets into the boxing ring or the MMA ring. Um, I think there was a big fight yesterday. They get into that ring knowing that this joke could come in for me. And this person can hit me with all their strength in my midsection. And when they hit me, because I know they're going to hit me, I can see them winding up about to hit me. I grimace, I pull my midsection together, and although they hit me, all I say is, mm, but I take it. I take it because I was ready for it. I was prepared for it. But that same fighter Little two-year-old niece can come hit them in the wrong place. Okay, y'all ain't going to work with me. And they'd be doubled over like, oh, Lord. okay, stop, Pastor Will. Why? Because they weren't expecting it. They didn't see it. They didn't know it was coming. It could be just as hard of a blow as the other one that you took. This one hurt. Because I wasn't ready for it. I didn't prepare myself for it. And so when it comes to betrayal, the hurt is devastating because it comes from a best friend that we didn't know, that we didn't expect, that we didn't anticipate. So how do we rise out of the ashes of unknown familiar friends? Unknown familiar friends. And the answer is to watch for what you can't see. I'm going to say that again. Watch for what you can't see. Sounds oxymoronous. It's an oxymoron. How can I watch for something that I can't see? 
Jesus says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. See, if I tell you when I'm coming, then you will set your alarm. Can I preach in this place? Be ready, get dressed, get ready, because you know I'm coming next Tuesday at 2 p.m. So you're going to make sure you're up, you're going to make sure you're ready, and you're going to make sure that when you show up, everything is copacetic. Everything is ready because I know when you're coming. So how do I watch when I don't know you're coming? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, if you stay ready, then you don't have to get ready. If you stay ready, then you don't have to get ready. See, I know you don't want nobody to come into your house unannounced, but if you keep your house clean, that went over three of y'all head. If your house is already clean, then you don't have to go rushing trying to clean it up when they show up. I know you weren't preparing on nobody riding with you, but preach right here. <laughs> you ever got a raft with somebody? They say, hold on, they're out there cleaning out the car, the vacuum and pulling all the trash, McDonald's wrappers and pulling stuff out there because they weren't ready. Boy, preach right there. They weren't ready. They weren't ready. They weren't ready. But again, if you stay ready, then you don't have to get ready. And so God says, stay ready. Stay ready. I don't know who you are. I don't know when you're going to do it. But if I stay ready, then I don't have to get ready. So how do we stay ready for what we can't see? The first thing is, is you stay ready by always praying. See, a lot of people only pray when they get in trouble. And I ain't got no problem, and you should pray when you get in trouble. You should go to church when you're about to lose your mind. I hate for you to stay out there and actually lose your mind. Uh, so you should. Uh, but see, hallelujah, getting help after the fact, uh, even though I can help you, uh, uh, I, I want you to understand it's better to get help before you need the help. Uh, it's better uh, to pray uh, not after you get in trouble, but pray before trouble ever show up. And so Jesus spoke a parable saying, men ought always to pray. See, we got to learn how to keep the line of communication open so that you ain't trying to get through when there's a dial tone or a busy signal or because you're already through. That's why we pray without ceasing. See, some of y'all got to learn that prayer is not just something you do on Sunday morning to open up the church service. Prayer is not just something that you do when you're about to lose your mind. Uh, prayer is not just something that you do uh, when you think about it here or there. Uh, the Bible meant it literally that we should always pray, that we should pray without ceasing. Uh, prayer uh, shouldn't be something that you get around to. Uh, it should be a lifestyle. Uh, it should be something that you do every day. We should always pray uh, because when I pray, uh, then I don't have to learn how to pray. Uh, when I pray, uh, then I don't have to get ready to pray uh, because I'm already praying. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, always pray. Uh, stay prayerful, uh, then you don't have to get prayerful. Uh, stay ready, uh, then you don't have to get ready. Uh, the second thing is always praise. Uh, now, they taught me, according to the word of God, uh, that God inhabits uh, the praises uh, of his people. Uh, and so, uh, if we praise God uh, and God enters into the atmosphere of the praise, uh, uh, hallelujah, how many of you all have ever experienced the presence of God doing praise and worship. How many of you all have ever experienced hallelujah God's overwhelming love over you doing praise and worship? That is because God inhabits the praises of his people. But I don't know about you. I need God more than on Sunday morning at 1045. Boy, preach right there. Cause see, y'all gonna take me through hell Saturday 
Tuesday, Thursday, and I don't need to wait until the trouble. Can you hold on till we get to the praise and worship part at the church service? You might have been and hurt somebody before we get to praise and worship. You may have cut somebody, quit, gave up, stopped. And so, since I know that God inhabits the praises of his people, maybe I need to learn how to keep a praise going on in my atmosphere. Maybe I can't sing like the praise and worship team, but I can get something. I can sing in the shower and act like I'm praise and worship. I can sing in the car and act like I'm all world. I can sing when others are taking a, a, a cigarette break. I can take me a praise break. But I tell you what, I don't need to be in a situation that I got to wait for you to praise God in order for me to experience the presence of God. I will bless the Lord. Not you will. Not the praise team will. Not the band will. But I will bless the Lord at all time and his praise shall continually be in my mouth so that if his praise is in my mouth then cussing you out ain't in my mouth if his praise is in my mouth then wanting to slap the mess out of you ain't in my mouth if his praise is in my mouth then I got an atmosphere in which God is is in control rather than the devil trying to tempt me. Somebody say praise. And even when I don't feel like praising, I offer God the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of joy. I don't wait till I feel it. I feel it when I praise him. I don't wait till I feel it. I feel it when I praise him. That's why they say I feel it all over me. I feel it in my hands. I feel it in my feet. I feel him all over me. Why do you feel God? Because I woke up with a praise. I went to work with a praise. When you was lying on me, I was praising. When I didn't get your promotion, I praised them. When you acted a fool, I blessed the Lord at all time. I rejoice evermore. And finally, I stay ready because I keep Keep my shield of faith up because I know doubt's going to show up. I know trouble is going to show up. But the Bible says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Because if I was looking, I might hurt somebody. But if I have my eyes on God, if I look to the hills from whence cometh my help, then it don't matter what you do, what you say. I stay ready by keeping my eyes on God and guess what as long as I'm looking at God I can't get lost as long as I look at God I can't get destroyed as long as I look at God even if I fall he gonna pick me right back up even if I fall a just man falleth seven times but he gets back up again because I meditate on his word day and night because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the the word of God. Look at somebody and say, stay ready, baby. Then you don't have to get ready. Stay ready. Then you don't have to get ready. Let me finish this. All right, all right, all right. We know how to deal with the unknown familiar friends. But what are you going to do once they reveal themselves? What are you going to do once you find out who it is? What are you going to do? Jesus said, then said Jesus unto him, that that thou doest, uh, do quickly. Uh, somebody say quickly. Uh, the next challenge we're going to have with betrayal uh, is when your betrayers uh, reveal themselves. Uh, see, it's painful enough uh, trying to deal with it uh, when I didn't know. Uh, but baby, once you find out, uh, oh boy, preach in this place. Uh, David said, my own familiar friend, uh, Holly, whom I trusted, uh, has lifted up his heels, uh, has turned against me. 
me. Uh, nothing hurts more uh, than when a familiar friend exposes you, deceives you, uh, or turns on you. Uh, nothing hurts more uh, than when it's revealed to you. Uh, there are people right now uh, that's been estranged uh, for years uh, because of what a familiar friend did. Uh, there are family members uh, that have not spoken uh, for decades uh, because of something that happened uh, back in 2003 uh, and it's 2024. Uh, there are people uh, that had best friends uh, since middle school uh, but all of a sudden they don't talk at all uh, because uh, they couldn't believe uh, that the person that I grew up with uh, would do this to me. Uh, it's tough. It's hard. Uh, the person that knows you better than you know your yourself uh, that's been around you uh, know how you sleep know how you snore I'm a preacher in this place uh, know what you smell like I ain't preaching about to nobody but myself if y'all ain't gonna work with me uh, I'll just preach the will then uh, but when that person uh, that person uh, reveals themselves uh, that hurt look at your neighbor say that right there hurts uh, that right there hurts uh, and so all uh, you know uh, is that uh, oh, hallelujah uh, it's very painful. Uh, so how do you rise out uh, of the ashes of a revealed uh, familiar friend? Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, uh, do it quickly. Uh, do it quickly. Uh, see, y'all be holding on to stuff too long. Uh, y'all be holding on. The Bible says be angry. Uh, he didn't say stay angry. Uh, the Bible says uh, you got to get into your emotions. Uh, he didn't say stay in your emotions. Uh, we've been holding on stuff uh, for far too long. Uh, and when you hold on for stuff too long, uh, you give the devil uh, Access uh, into your soul. Uh, that's why the Bible says, Be angry and sin not. Uh, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Uh, neither give place uh, to the devil. Uh, see, remember I told you to always pray? Uh, well, here's what prayer does for you. Uh, the Bible says, uh, Be careful for nothing but with prayer uh, and supplication with thanksgiving. Uh, make your request known unto God, uh, and the peace of God, uh, which passes all understanding, shall keep uh, or guard or protect your heart so here you praying and the spirit of God is standing at the door of your heart guarding your heart but because ninja preach right here you wouldn't let it go because you held on to it long Holy Ghost guarding your front door but you didn't told the joker come around back and you just letting the devil in the back door boy I'm gonna preach right up in here the Holy Ghost is guarding you but because you wouldn't let it go the devil got access to your heart through the back door you left all the windows open boy I'm a preacher in here you just left everything open Holy Ghost trying to protect you you're going to church you're praising you're worshiping but you won't let the mess go and because you won't let it go the devil slips in gets in through a crack gets in through the back door come through a window slide down the chimney. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, uh, when you hold on to it, uh, you give the devil access. Uh, you give him access. Uh, you've been holding on to stuff. Uh, listen, if I'm going to live in hell, uh, I ain't going to die and go to hell over you. Uh, if I'm going to live in hell, uh, I'm not going to hold that bitterness, uh, that anger, uh, that unforgiveness in my heart. Uh, live in hell uh, and die and go to hell. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you better do what Jesus did and do it quickly. He said, listen, if you're going to lie, lie quickly so I can get past it. If you're going to hurt me, hurt me quickly. Don't be dragging this mess out and don't you drag it out yourself. Don't be holding on to stuff 10 years later. you still bitter. 15 years later, you mad, don't even remember why you're mad. You just know that you're mad. And 
slow. Jesus said, do it quickly. If you're going to be angry, be angry, but get over it. If you're going to be mad, be mad, but get over it. Somebody say, do it quickly. Do it quickly. Do it quickly. You can't hold on to that mess or the devil will come in. If you're going to do it, do it so I can get over it, so I can get through it, so I can get around it, but I ain't going to stay in it. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you've been holding on too long. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I got places to be. I got things to do, and I ain't going to hold on to your betrayal. I couldn't believe it's you, but now that I know it's you, bam, do it quickly. Now that I know it's you, go ahead and get it over with, because I got better places to be, better things to do, and I got to get free of you. Somebody, anybody, say hallelujah. Why do you got to get free? Because Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to bring sight to the blind, and to bring liberty to them that are bruised. But guess what? As long as I'm holding on to you, I can't get my freedom. As long as I'm holding on to your mess, I can't get my sight back. As long as I'm holding on to your betrayal, I can't get broken out of my jail. I can't get my heart fixed. I can't get my heart made up. I can't get my broken heart healed. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Cause the sooner I let it go, the sooner I get my heart healed. The sooner I let it go, the sooner I get broke out of my prison, out of my addiction, out of my depression. The sooner I let it go, the sooner I get out of being blind, the sooner I let it go, the sooner I get free. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got places to go. I got things to do. I got people to see. I got an assignment on my life and I can't sit around waiting on you. Get free because whom the spirit of the Lord has made free is free indeed. Get somebody a high five and say do it quickly. Get out of it quickly. Do it quickly. Get your sight back quickly. Do it quickly. Get out of jail quickly. Do it quickly. Get free quickly. Do it quickly. Do it quickly. If you're going to lie, lie. If you're going to hurt, hurt. If you're going to stab, stab. Because the sooner you do it, the sooner I get free. Y'all praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Grab somebody by the hand. Grab them by the hand. Grip that hand. Shake that hand. Squeeze that hand. Pull on that hand. Yank that hand. Then look at that hand and say, hand, the longer you hold on to this, the longer it's going to hurt. Now look at that hand. Now snatch it away and say, I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Free from disappointment. Free from depression. Free from anger. Free from bitterness. I'm free. You did what you did, but I'm free because I didn't hold on. I didn't hold on. I 
I didn't hold on, but I let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Look at three people and say, let it go quickly. Let it go quickly. Let it go quickly. It's going to hurt, but let it go. It's going to devastate, but let it go. It's going to bother you, but let it go. Let it go. Woo! Woo! Let it go. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. I'm going to stop there. Because I'm going to do another part. It gets into my third point. It's literally never say respond appropriately. It said respond appropriately. See, when somebody hurts you, you want to go in. You ride or die. Like Jesus, you want to get us? You want us to get our stuff? Jesus, I got my peace. You want me to go get it? Eleven of the disciples said, "Do you want us to get our sword?" Because they kept it back at the house. Peter had a concealed carry permit. He didn't have to go get his. He just came out swinging. Y'all ain't working with me. Some of y'all got concealed cu carry cuss out folk. You got concealed carry anger. Huh? Concealed carry slash. Huh? Concealed carry. Huh? You like Peter. Huh? You shoot before they even ask. Huh? Do you want me to get my gun? Huh? Cause you carry your stuff all the time. I'm gonna stop there, but next week I'm gonna really dig into responding. How do we respond to betrayal? How should we respond to re betrayal? How did Jesus want us to respond to betrayal? My notes say you always have to respond in love. It's hard, y'all. It's hard now to respond in love because they surely wasn't showing no love towards you. Next week, I want to talk about... You've heard of involuntary manslaughter? I want to talk about involuntary betrayal. Because some people betray you and don't even really realize what they've done. We're going to deal with that next week. Give the Lord a great big hand. Praise everybody. The problem with involuntary manslaughter, even though you didn't mean it, I'm still dead. Well, I ain't mean it. Yeah, ninja, but I'm dead. I'm still hurt. My heart is still bleeding. I'm still broken. I'm still angry. I'm still mad. It may have been involuntary because I, I said that when I was going through. I said, I said, boy, I can't believe they did that. Somebody, somebody told me, well, Pastor, I don't think they meant it that way. At that time, I'm like, I don't care. I'm still bleeding. I'm still hurt. I'm still on lockdown. I'm still blinded. And so how should we respond? How should we respond? How should we respond? Lift those hands towards heaven. I don't know who this word was for, but if it was for you, meet me at the altar real quick. If there was a part of this message 
and I know it was for somebody because the Holy Spirit told me to touch and agree with you. Meet me down here at this altar real quickly.